Well, good morning. I just want to welcome you once again to Fremont Community Church. My name is Matt, and I'm the pastor of communications and online ministry here at FCC. And uh, I'm excited to be kicking off our series this morning. And what better way to kick off a series but with some awesome Christmas decor uh, in our atrium and on stage. just want to say a big thank you to Laura Lee and the decor team for putting all this together. Um, just want to say it was put up on November 30th, so it didn't quite meet the December 1st mark, but you know, the personal preferences, it's okay. But uh, it's crazy, today is December 1st, uh, and we are leading up to the season of Christmas. And so uh, we decided to take uh, an interesting route this year for our series in Advent. We, uh, we're still lighting the, the candles as we go through the week's of Advent, but we are talking about this idea that the kingdom is here. In the course of Jesus' ministry, there's something bigger going on behind the scenes that sometimes we don't get at first glance. And we're going to kick off uh, our series talking today, uh, looking at that through the lens of healing. And so I want to just throw it out to, to everyone here. Uh, feel free to shout out, what are some times that we see Jesus healing in the Bible. The leper, yeah, leprosy. Lots of skin conditions that were uh, not uh, okay to touch, and he healed them, yeah. Blind, the woman in the cloak, and there was one back here. The Oh, yeah, the, the well. Yeah, the pool, yeah. The man by the pool, yeah. Guy in chains, paralyzed, there's one over here. Yeah, raising people from the dead. That's kind of a big one, right? That's kind of crazy. These are all so good. They're, I mean, they're called miracles for a reason. They're miraculous. Uh, and a lot of people, they followed Jesus because of these awesome things that he did uh, to the point where he got a little frustrated because he's trying to go from town to town and talk to people and hear their stories and minister to them. And he has these big crowds following him that are making it difficult to travel from place to place, and they're following him because of the awesome things that he's doing and not the awesome person that he is. And so uh, Jesus says, you're missing the point. The point is that the kingdom is here. If you're just here because you think I'm a magician, uh, then you're here for the wrong reasons. There's, uh, there's something that I'm trying to point you to, and I don't want you to miss the point. And so all of these miracles of healing are incredible, and they, they deserve praise. They deserve uh, admiration. And we should also be willing to take a step back and ask, well, why is Jesus doing these healings? Well, yeah, it meets a, a practical need, but uh, is there something bigger going on here? And you'll notice that I'm saying that a lot it's because it's important. That's the main thing that I want us to walk away with today is that Jesus is doing something bigger behind the scenes. And so if we're just looking at a story in the Bible uh, and we can read it and say, that's good, that's, that's cup filling, uh, but there's a much bigger narrative going on here that I think the biblical authors want us to see. And so we are going to take a look at uh, a story from Luke chapter 8. Uh, verse 40 to 55 this morning. Uh, and it's actually one of the ones that was shouted out. Uh, our uh, half, uh, at least, uh, is in this story, the woman who was healed from, from bleeding. Um, I'm going to be reading in the New American Standard Bible, but feel free to read in whatever translation you are comfortable with. Um, just pick this for some, some word choice here. But let's go ahead and, and jump in. Uh, it says, and as Jesus was returning, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And a man named Jairus came, and he was an official of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet and began urging him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing against him, and a woman who had suffered a chronic flow of blood for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Now this is uh, already on its own, a wonderful story of healing. 
the thing that I want to point out is some of these key words that I've put in bold here, uh, just for our benefit as we are reading through this story. We're going to see a few parallels between uh, this man Jairus and his daughter uh, and the woman who was bleeding. And uh, you'll see it says about 12 years old was the age of the daughter, and uh, the woman was bleeding for 12 years chronically. Now, it's something that we could very easily skim over, but we need to remember that the authors of the Bible, they are master storytellers. What they're doing here is using very intentional word choice to say these two distinct individuals actually form one cohesive narrative. And so we're going to see parallels between them as the passage continues. So it goes on. As Jesus said, and Jesus said, uh, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, people are crowded and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had left me. Now when the woman saw that she had not escaped to notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and admitted in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. And if this is where the story ended, that would be pretty sad. So bear with me. But I do think it's important to pause and reflect here. The thing that I love about Jesus when he's healing that I also am really frustrated about with Jesus in this story is how much time he intentionally takes with people. Uh, See, Jesus is a a pretty powerful dude with all these miracles that we mentioned, but uh, he's he's very personal with them. Uh, I mean, he's not like the Oprah of healing. He's not like blindness cured, paralyzed, you can walk, demon possession, no problem. You get a healing, you get a healing, look under your chair, everyone gets a healing, right? Okay, and that was 100 healings, we're good. I'm going to go get some unleavened bread, call it a day. (laughs) That's, That's not how Jesus operates. He sits and he talks with people. Sometimes you have to read between the lines a little bit because we have all, these, all this information about these people, uh, but we don't actually see the whole conversation that plays out because the Bible is kind of a long book already, right? And so uh, they condense things and they say, this is what we learned about this person, probably because Jesus sat down and spent some time talking to this woman. But the tricky thing is, is I mean, Jesus is on the clock. He, he knows that, Right? <laughs> Like, Jairus came, and, and he, uh, he, both he and the woman come down, and they, they fall down to Jesus' knees. There's a sense of desperation, of longing, of hopelessness, of, Jesus, I, I need you, and I am out of options. I mean, does he, does he forget that he's just on the way to, to do a different miracle, and he gets caught up in the current miracle? It, it can almost be easy to... Uh, to say that the Jesus was constrained for time and he had to pick and choose, but that's, that's not the case. Uh, we actually see in a couple different passages of Scripture that Jesus is capable and does heal people from a distance. Uh, we see that with the centurion's servant in Matthew 8 and Luke 7, with the Canaanite woman's daughter in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, and with the royal official's son in John 4. So it kind of begs the question, if Jesus was able to heal this girl from a distance, why didn't he? And it's not a situation that we're put in morally in a lot of other healing stories, and that's why we're talking about this one today, because it's tricky. Why couldn't Jesus say, okay, yeah, you're healed. I'm here with you. Also, girl at home, you're healed as well. Jairus, go home and be with your daughter. She's fine. He's done it before, so why not now? 
And I think it's a situation that this congregation is very familiar with. Uh, it's a sad but true state of being that this congregation has experienced illness and pain and suffering and loss. And this might seem like a really weird turn for a sermon on healing, but I think it's important for us to be able to acknowledge that things are difficult. And sometimes healing doesn't come when we want it to. And that's sad. And sad isn't a word that even does it justice. And I'll assure you, I have not been a third party observer when it comes to this. Uh, but that's a sermon for a different time. <laughs> I think we need to be okay talking about illness and death because it's going to come whether we want it to or not. And we can either be ready to talk about it and have hope to cling to, or it can catch us by surprise. Either way, though, I just have to shout out this congregation. And, and if this is your first time here, this probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, <laughs> everything that I'm, I'm talking about. But this congregation, I've seen go through so much in recent years. And with no credit to us as a staff at all, but just you as, as a church, I've seen you come alongside each other in such wonderful and incredible ways, caring for each other and bringing hope and healing through times of mourning. And that's, I believe, what Jesus is trying to point us to in this passage, is that while we sit, while we wait, while we mourn, it's not the end. It's not the end of the story. It's also not the end of this passage, thankfully. So let's go ahead and let's finish out the, the last few verses of this passage so that we can see where Jesus is going with this. When Jesus heard this, he responded to him, do not be afraid any longer, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except for Peter, John, and James, his three closest disciples, and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and mourning for her. And Jesus said, stop weeping, for she has not died, she's asleep. And they began laughing at him, understandably, knowing that she had died. Like, Jesus, come on, man, read the room. What is, what is going on here? He, however, took her by the hand and spoke forcefully, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up immediately. And he ordered that something be given to her to eat. We see this, this word immediately used in both of these healings. This woman had been suffering from a chronic condition for 12 years. No one else was able to heal her. And with just a touch of Jesus' cloak, she's immediately healed. This girl is dying, and there's this anxiousness, this waiting. Like I said, I, I became a father recently, and I can't imagine what Jairus is going through during this time, waiting to see if his daughter is going to be okay, only to learn that she died. And then Jesus comes in and says, nah, she's just taking a nap. That's confusing, right? Like, I'm not the only one confused by that. Are you guys confused? Okay, yeah, it, it, it should be confusing, right? Maybe not intentionally, but we have to remember that the Bible is not written originally in English. This passage in particular is written in Greek. And so I want to take a quick look at this word that's translated as asleep. It's pronounced cathudo. Can you say that? Cathudo. Yeah. Uh, it's translated as a sleep 100% uh, of the time that it's used. So we're, we're pretty confident on this, this meaning. It can mean dead or dead faith. The thing is, is that Jesus is pointing to this idea that death is temporary when he says that she's asleep. It's, uh, it's almost like when your car battery dies, 
right? The first thing you do, you pop the hood and you chuck the battery out because it's not useful anymore, right? No, you, you, you call up a friend, you grab some jump, jumper cables, and you give it a jump start, and it comes back to life. Jesus, when he says she's asleep, is not saying, oh, she's just taking a snooze. He's saying, no, she's just waiting to be woken up. And that idea points us to hope. You see, Jesus allows them to mourn for a period, and then he says, okay, now the time is done for mourning. Now is the time for her to wake up. And so whether you can relate with the woman who was bleeding, who was desperate and falling to Jesus' knees after 12 years to finally be healed, or if you relate with Jairus and his daughter, having experienced a loss that came too soon. Both of these stories point to this idea of hope. And they don't neglect the fact that things are sad. And they don't happen on our timeline. They happen on God's timeline. Which honestly is frustrating. <laughs> uh, I wish that healing would just happen. But again, remember, he's not the Oprah of healing. He's not just dishing out healing left and right. He's pointing to something greater. I think it's so fitting that we lit the hope candle today and that we are going to celebrate the act of communion today. We're going to participate and come together because just as Jesus is waiting patiently with his family and mourning while this girl is dead and eventually comes back to life, Jesus does a pretty impressive thing and he dies, and he comes back to life. He doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. He puts his money where his mouth is and says, this story, while it points to hope, is not just about me making other people go through this, but I'm going to go through this myself. And I'm going to show you that there is hope, even when I don't feel like there is. So as we wrap up, I'm going to invite the band back up, and I'm, I'm just going to share something that's been really encouraging to me, something that Jesus says when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night that he's going to be betrayed. He is going to be put on trial, even though he's innocent. He's going to be abandoned by everyone that he cares about and loves. He's going to suffer and be in pain, and he's going to die. And when he's in the garden, Jesus says a prayer, and the cliff notes of what he says is, God, if, if there's any way out of this, please let me know, because I I don't know if I can do this. This is a lot to ask. But what gives me hope is what Jesus says next. He says, but not my will, God, but your will be done. It's a really hard place to sit in, especially if we're in a period of mourning. But as someone who suffers with chronic pain, I, I can tell you that sometimes you just need to cling to whatever hope is coming. And Jesus inspires me in, in, in this story of him going to the cross, and that's why we celebrate communion. It's his, his body and his blood broken for us. But Jesus' death is not the point of that story. This girl's death is not the point of this story. They both happen. They're both sad. They're heartbreaking. But the point is that resurrection is coming. And in order for resurrection to come, Jesus had to die. And in order for him to die, he had to be betrayed. He had to go through these things, terrible things, in order for 
resurrection to happen. And, and that's what we celebrate when we eventually come to Easter is that Jesus is declaring victory over every pain, every illness, every condition, even death. There's hope. He's making all things new. There's restoration to come. Mind, body, spirit, relationship. The healing is good. The healing meets a need. But the healing points to something better. And that's full and complete restoration with him. So if you're here this morning and you're, you're struggling with something, I'm sorry if this caught you off guard. I think it's a, a grim reality that we, we live in that if we talk about healing, we need to ask the question, well, what if healing doesn't come? And we have to know that there is hope, that this girl's story points forward to resurrection, to the resurrection of her, and forward even further to the resurrection of Jesus, which points even further forward to what we talked about in our Revelation series, the restoration of all things. So healing is good. Restoration is better. And that is the hope that we cling, cling on to no matter what life throws our way. And that is the ultimate healing that we can find our hope in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just... We come before you. Life is hard. And sometimes... Life kicks us while we're down. Sometimes things seem inexplicable and they don't make sense. And we ask that you just help them make sense. Just give us clarity. Give us hope, even when it feels like things are hopeless. Give us community around us to support us, to mourn with us, and to ultimately remind us that hope is on the way that death is not the end, that we'll be restored from our illnesses, we'll be reunited with our loved ones that we've lost. God, we know that your healing goes much deeper than just the physical. We ask that you give us patience and understanding and hope as we wait for your timing. Because, God, you are the great physician. We know that you can heal. And even if you're not healing now, we know that you will. Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done and all you will do. The way that you've been present, you are present, and you will be present with your church. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.